Let me ask you a question this morning that you probably do not want to answer. Do you have a will? I don't mean a will like a desire to do something. I mean actually a legal will. The reason I say probably a lot of you don't want to be asked that question is because probably for a lot of you the answer is no. Now, for those of you who perhaps don't even know what I'm talking about, a will is a legal document that coordinates the distribution of your assets after death. And you might be saying, Eric, that's why I don't have a will. I don't have much assets. So why take the time? But it's important, especially if you have children, to appoint guardians for your children who are minors. The chances are most of you do not. Only 46% of Americans actually have a will. Obviously, as you get older, the chances increase that you have one. 76% of Americans who are 65 and over have a will. They have a sense of like, my life is getting closer and closer to the end. I should probably do something. But if you're age 30 to 49, and so many of you are sitting here this morning, only 36% of you have one. Well, you might be thinking, why do I need a will? Well, the reality is because would you like to determine or would you like the state of Florida to determine where all your assets go? I think you might want to have a say in that. But let me ask you a different question this morning that you probably do want to think about and maybe have thought a lot about. Are you in someone else's will? That one's much more entertaining to think about. That one's when you kind of love to sort of imagine. That one you kind of like a, a chance to survey family. Friends, maybe distant relatives you didn't know that you had until they died and somebody came knocking to introduce the fact that you were once related to somebody that you did not know but has left you something. This is a fun exercise. Wills can be funny and sadly they can at times also be hurtful. For example, in 2004, billionaire Leona Helmsley left instructions for her $4 billion that she left to be spent caring for dogs. Having apparently rethought an earlier draft that left it to the poor. Her nine-year-old dog, a Maltese named Trouble, we're restrained from saying anything about that, her dog received $12 million in the will with her grandchildren either being cut out of the will or ordered to visit their father's grave annually in order to inherit their share. I guarantee you that's a calendar appointment they did not miss. The dog Trouble inheritance was later reduced by a judge from 12 million to 2 million, but the dog had to go into hiding because of death and kidnap threats. I'm not making this up, people. Well, the biggest question to answer this morning is not whether you have a will. By the way, you should get one. They're quite easy. You can do this online. They, or whether you're in your parents' or spouse's will. The biggest question for you to answer is whether or not you are in a guy named Abraham's will. A man you've never met. And the question is whether or not he is a distant relative of yours or not and whether or not you're in his will. The title of this morning's message is, Are You in the Will? And our text is Galatians chapter 4, and I want to ask you to turn there in your Bibles if you've not done so already. If you're new to Grace Church and you don't have a Bible, you'd like to have one. I mean, like, if you own one at home, you've got a Bible. But if you don't have any Bible and you'd like to have one, we have them available for you for free at the Welcome Center. You can just go there afterwards and be glad to give you one are going to the book of Galatians, and we're learning about how Paul is addressing these churches in the southern part of Galatia, the Mediterranean area, new Christians, and these new Christians, after having been first taught by Paul the gospel, having responded to it and growing, they're now being kind of drawn away by false teachers. He's having to come back and correct this through his writing. And what we're going to see this morning is really the question about the will and what you will inherit, not in this lifetime, but in eternity. 
Because the question that we have to ask is, depending on whose will you're really in, determines your future. Now, just to give you a sneak peek in where we're headed, let me tell you where we are going so you understand this entire text in summary fashion. We're going to break it down. Christians share in three things. In Jesus' inheritance, they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and they have God as their Father. You have that on the screen. G Christians share in Jesus' inheritance, are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and have God as their Father. This takes us to our text this morning, Galatians chapter 4. Look with me if you would. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. In this text this morning, there's three observations we need to make, and you'll see them kind of flow through the text. We've done an initial introduction to it, but we're going to go back to it and kind of slow the tape down and make sure we don't miss it, because each is significant and increasingly important in its implications. First of all, back in verses 1 to 3 is the illustration. The illustration he gives, that the law of God is temporary. Now, if you would, just kind of notice the argument here. Go back, if you would, to verse 29 of chapter 3 of Galatians. After making the statements he makes about there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, he says this in verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. This term heir is not unique to here, it's said throughout the scripture, but it's used even increasingly before, earlier in the book of Galatians. He speaks about this idea of being an heir of God, an heir of Abraham. And really, ultimately, you can see this. As you see it earlier in chapter 3, go back, if you would, to verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. The ultimate reality is that Christ is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and what would be given to Abraham's offspring. And everybody who's related to Abraham through the same faith that Abraham had in the risen one would be an heir. That's what it says in verse 29 of Ephesians or Galatians chapter 3. This takes us into now verses 1 through 2 with the explanation of verse 3. Verses 1 and 2 is basically an illustration. Paul, in verses 1 and 2, is basically giving an illustration from kind of Greek-Roman culture at that time of what it was like to be a child in a house. He says it's similar with the law. The law is like a prison warden in chapter 3, verse 23. It's like a school teacher in verse 24. And what the idea that Paul is describing here around this time when he is writing is that it would be customary for a wealthy person to hand the heir over to the care of the guardian. They're they're young, they're minors. This is not uncommon even today. You think about somebody who's going to inherit their parents' fortune, but they're a minor. The parents are wise. They're not going to give their kids all that money. Why? Because the kids are going to spend it like on candy and movies and scooters and games, stupid stuff. You're like, wait, that's stupid? If you're an adult and we're asking that question, we should probably talk. So the the parent is protecting the child from the child being given that type of blessing too early. And so he's like, functionally, the child in the house is like the same as a slave. He has no sort of special privileges. He has to get money from the parent like anybody else has to get money. There's a uniqueness here, a sense in which the relationship is just one of normalcy. Though he is the owner of everything. Then verse 2 he says, but he is under guardians and a manager until the date set by his father. He's talking about when do you get to inherit it. 
Now, this reference he's giving here is this idea about a date, a particular time. Now, in the state of Florida, every state can be different a little bit, though a lot of them are similar. In the state of Florida, depending on how old you are determines what you can do. So, for example, if you're 13 or under, you cannot drive a, what they call a personal watercraft, i.e. a wave runner jet ski. You can't do that. But if you're 14, you can if you own it or your parents own it. But you can't rent one unless you're 18. You can drive a car and be given a learner's permit when you're 15, but you can't get a full unrestricted license until you're 18. When you're 18, you, you can also do some other things of responsibility. You can vote. You can determine the leadership of your country when you're 18. You can sign up for the military before you're 18 as long as you have your guardian's approval. These things continue. A law was changed recently moving the age from 18 to 21 until you can buy a handgun. It's not until you're 21 that you can buy cigarettes or other type of nicotine objects. See, even the state realizes we have to treat children with some protection for their sake, to protect them. But when the date comes, they're given full access and opportunity to, to participate like everybody else. Well, this is the illustration that Paul is giving here in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And then he says this idea, but then a time is come. In the same way also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, the elementary principles of the world, Paul appears here to be talking about the law given to Moses. This is a very greatly debated interpretation because of so much is being said about it, is that the different principles of the earth, air, sky, light. But what's being said here based on the context is that the laws of God are indeed the basic principles of the world, the essential components of how you live, right and wrong. The Mosaic Law, we think of them accordingly, the Ten Commandments. These are the elementary principles, the basic realities. And the reason he's referencing this, of which we'll talk about more next week because he references the same phrase, is that the law was never intended to be the final word. Paul is telling Judaizers here through teaching the Galatians, they're wrong. Let's think of it like this. We just recently talked about those who graduated from high school, from college, from grad school. What Paul is basically saying here is, listen, the Judaizers are telling you to go backwards, not forwards. It's like telling somebody who graduated with their doctorate, they have a PhD, they have their, their medical license, they're a practicing physician, whatever that might be, they have a doctorate, telling them, hey, you need to now go back to kindergarten and learn your ABCs. You're like, are, are, you, are you kidding me? You're not serious, are you? That would be insulting. That would be a reversal of educational direction. That's exactly the kind of idea what Paul is talking about here. The Judaizers, these false teachers are coming in and telling these new Christians, hey, you need to go backwards to the law and you need to be circumcised based on what it says in Genesis 17. And Paul's like, you realize you're moving them away from Christ, not towards Christ. You're moving them towards their identity being in the law, not being through faith in Christ. You're, you're going the opposite direction here. He says, you're thinking the wrong way. This is the illustration that Paul gives. The law of God is temporary. But the third, excuse me, the second observation is verses four and five. It's the connection. He starts to connect these points now. The gospel is how one is adopted and becomes an heir. Look back to, if you would, to now verse four and five. And if there ever was something to underline here in these verses, here it is, friends. Each part is significant. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let's slow it down and look at these together because you do not want to miss the significance of what he is stating here. It is a tight 
profound gospel summary that has huge encouraging implications for us today. The very beginning here when it says the fullness of time had come, this really points back to verse 2. Back to verse 2, in the illustration he gave, he talked about this father who is under guard, this, the child's under guardians and managers, and it says, until the date set by his father. That type of imagery is what comes forth here now in verse 4, and it says, but when the fullness of time had come. I, I hear in this the, the, the ripple of what Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. When Mark is writing and giving the account of the story, it says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And listen to what Jesus said in verse 15. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Have you ever wondered why Jesus came when he came? Why not earlier? Why not later? Why not come today? Why not show up now as his first appearing? There's a lot of speculation about that. Perhaps at the development of society through Roman rule and through the, the paving of roads and the exchange in commerce, that, that provided a, a means by which the gospel through its ambassadors would spread to the rest of the world. It's all speculation, though. We don't know the exact reason because no one knows the mind of God except simply know by history we know the will of God. He chose then, in that place, in that time, with those people to finally come. What had been promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the very beginning of time, came to pass, is what we see in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. God chose the timing. God chose the place. God chose the circumstances, and it was perfect. Now, here's why this matters to you and me today. No doubt there are things in your life and my life that we can sit here and wonder why is God not doing what I think he should be doing, when he should be doing it, where he should be doing it? You have questions, and you'd like answers. I cannot speak on God's behalf as to why he's doing what he's doing in your life when he's doing it, but I can speak to who is doing it. God, who is perfectly knowledgeable, perfectly powerful, perfectly good and wise, and is determining what should happen, when it should happen, for your good. Bringing him glory. How this should be a point where we can be reminded again, we can trust him with our lives as we see him rule over history. Look back at the text in this verse four. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Friends, this is speaking about the deity of Jesus. God sending forth his son, this is the fact that the son was sent, shows that he existed before he was born in Bethlehem. His sending from heaven declares his divine nature. Jesus Christ is God the son, fully equal to the father in glory and majesty. His sonship is eternal. He is the only begotten Son of the Father, the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is the Son of God. And yet, he goes right from talking about his deity to his humanity. Look back at the text. Look what it says. God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. That is mind-blowing. God is 100% man, and 100% God in the reality of how Jesus appears in human flesh. How he appears, Jesus, the son of God. Born of a woman, this emphasis is not so much him being born of a virgin. That's true in other verses in the scripture. Here the emphasis is on Jesus' humanity, and this is crucial. Jesus has to become like us in order to be qualified to be a substitute for us. He has to become like us so he can be one to replace us, which is why the next part is significant. Born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. God has to come and do what you and I nor anybody else in history has ever done. Obey God's law perfectly. 
Have you lied, stolen, cheated, lusted, been lazy, selfish, bitter, angry, greedy, malicious, unforgiving? I have. So much so I can't even keep count. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he sees the holiness of God and he sees it by comparison to himself, he says, I am a man of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips. Against the holiness of God backdrop, I am a wreck. Nobody can stand before God on their own credibility, on their own resume, and present it and be accepted. No one's going to be accepted by God based upon their own righteousness, having obeyed the law. But that's why he sent his son to be born like us, to fulfill what we could never do, as it says there, to redeem those who are under the law. This is a a language of ransom. Someone paid the penalty for your release. Somebody paid the penalty for your release. This is profoundly significant. And then why? Why did he do this? Verse five, so that we might receive. This is the reason for this. We might receive adoption as sons. Just want to be clear about what you just heard. God does not have to adopt us in order to forgive us. God can release our guilty punishment, release us from that. He can declare us righteous, but is not obligated in doing so to adopt us. But it states clearly here, he chooses to do this. There are no natural born children of God. Everyone is adopted. This is not only true if you're Jewish, it's also true that no matter what family you're born into, it does not matter. Listen to me, for those who are children here, For those who are younger here, for those of you who mistakenly think like children, that you are a Christian because you're born into a Christian family, because your mom or dad are Christians, because you are identifying with the Christian religion as some alternative to atheism or Buddhism or Muslim, that does not set you free from the penalty of your sin. That will not declare you forgiven. That will not secure your adoption. Only faith in Christ alone. Not faith plus your good works. Not faith plus your sacraments. Not faith plus your promise to be obedient. Your faith alone in Christ alone. This is phenomenal. We think about a young child who comes with his parents going hiking. Have you ever gone hiking with your parents? You ever gone in the woods? You're like, what's the woods? We live in the concrete jungle of Miami. One of the things I loved doing with my kids when they were younger was taking them backpacking and hiking. We first lived in California, lived in Indiana, and we'd visit family in North Carolina, and that was a fun thing for us to do. And one of the best parts of coming down is coming to a part where you come across a creek or river, and you got to cross it. And you get to the point where, at that point for the child, the child's got to cross it themselves. The parent can't cross it for the child. The child's got to cross it. They have slippery rocks. You were about falling in, and the child's got to make that decision. And making that decision, they either have to stay on the other side or cross like their mother or father did so they can be on the other side of the trail and continue to go where they're destined to go. Well, that child might be scared, like, I don't want to cross. I don't want that you. And the parent's like, I can't throw you. It's too far. I can't go with you. I'll fall in myself. You have to watch my example and cross yourself. That child might cry and sit there all day going, I'm not going. That child might change their mind. There's a bear coming. It might be all of a sudden freshly motivated to give out an attempt to somehow, some way, cross that creek, cross that river to get to the other side. But they got to make that decision. Friends, this is no trail. There's no bear. But there is a decision to be made. And there's a life that will be ending. And there will be hell as a consequence. And no matter how young or old you are, you've got to make that decision yourself. Your parent cannot throw you across cannot make that decision for you. You have to decide for yourself, do you have full confidence that Jesus has paid for your sin? Or are you resorting to superstitious, finger-crossing, morality-attempting, nice guy, 
communicating attempts to somehow barter with God that he owes you because of that. It will not be enough. That's what it says here in the text. It takes us third and final, and very importantly, to the implication. We've seen the illustration. We've seen the connection. Now Paul wants us to consider the implication. Christians have God as their father. We go back to verse six and seven. Kind of continuing on this theme of receiving adoption of sons, he says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. He's basically returning back to what we talked about in Galatians chapter three, verses one through five. He says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. There's a lot of implications to this text. God has sent his son. He's also sent his spirit. This is exactly what he promised. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 16 and 17. Through the prophet Isaiah, Jesus, the son of God, is speaking. He says, draw near to me. Hear this from the beginning. I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer, the holy one of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. What's happening here is the reality in Isaiah 48 of what the promise that came true with Jesus. Jesus came, and even Jesus said himself, after he would leave, one would come, the Holy Spirit, who would be a comforter. You ever thought about the reality of when you hang out with somebody, you kind of start to take on their mannerisms? Perhaps you've come home after being with some friends, and your mom or dad is like, you've been with so-and-so? How do you know? You sound like them. They're rubbing off on you. You talk like them. Their vocabulary becomes your vocabulary. And for some parents today, that basically means they don't know what their kids are saying. The slang is so far removed from their understanding. They're like, I don't understand. Is something on fire? Because you keep talking about it's lit, and I don't know what that means. (laughs) And banging is something making a noise. I don't know what's happening, and I'm just trying to understand what's going on here. When you're around people, young or old, you start to take on their mannerisms, you start to take on their language, you take on their perspective. What's happening here is that Christians, new Christians and older Christians, are taking on the reality of the relationship that Jesus has with God the Father. They have themselves as well. They are now children who are adopted. And the language they have even becomes what we see that Jesus had himself. This term, Abba, Father, in the text is one of the most significant names of God in the Bible in understanding how God relates to people. The word Abba, it's not the name of a band from the 70s. The word Abba is an Aramaic word that means father. It's a common term that expressed affection and confidence and trust. Abba signified a close relationship, an intimate relationship with the father and his child, as well as the childlike trust that the young child put in their father. They held his hand as they clung to his leg, as they found safety and security in his presence, that what they could be with their dad, they would be okay. The word Abba is used in the scripture three times, and it's always followed up with the use of the word father. First of all, in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus is addressing his father in prayer in Gethsemane. Look at what he says in Mark 14, verse 36. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. There's the influence of one talking to the father like that who rubs off on another. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 and 16 is another example. 
Or Paul says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit, there it is again, himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit's work being mentioned alongside the idea that God's children and Christ are related together. And then here in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 is the third citation. This idea here is like doubling down on the emphasis, God as Father. Let me just offer a clarification I've mentioned before, but I want to offer it again because it's appropriate to do so here in the text. It's wrong to state It's wrong to say that all people are children of God. That would be an inaccurate statement to say. It is true that we are all God's creation, that we're all under God's authority and lordship, that we will all be judged by him, but the right to be a child of God and call him Abba Father is something that only Christians have. Hence why Christians can be so confident in prayer God has obligated himself to hear the prayers of his people who are Christians. Think of what John says in John chapter one, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, referring to Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now this is fascinating. Who were born, how they become children of God, not of blood, I mean not who they're related to, nor of the will of the flesh, not by their own decision themselves, nor of the will of man, not because somebody else wanted to become a Christian, but of God. Even the work of God's work in their life and saving them is because of God did that work. When God caused us to be born again, as we see in John chapter three, we were adopted into the family of God, re- redeemed from the curse of sin, made heirs of God, and all of that because of that. Now, I recognize the reality. I spoke earlier this morning about motherhood. And I said, I understand when I speak about motherhood, it's a complicated conversation. For the woman with the barren womb, for the woman who has a difficult relationship with the child or child has a difficult relationship with the mother. Similar so can to the relationship when we start talking about God as father, be a complicated relationship for some of you. Even just this past week, I was hearing an interview of two people who acknowledged they were not Christians that the idea of God was very complicated for them because they thought of God only in so much as they thought of their relationship with their father. And depending on how that relationship went, kind of determined what they thought of God. And one person relayed to the idea that their God was basically, you know, you know, without pants, walking around drunk in the house, never able to be pleased, and always sort of worried about their wrath. That's how they thought of God because that's how they had a father. Another one was more distant, always gone, always helping others, but never caring for them themselves. The problem can be you can read your experience into Scripture and that wrongly distort your interpretation of Scripture. And I want to be careful to flag that for you this morning so that you might not make that mistake because God doesn't want you to think of him in that way. God would like to speak for himself. He would like to represent himself without the liability of these good or bad experiences you've had from previous relationships. This is why this is so profoundly important because to view God as father as he is a perfect father and to be adopted by him is a remarkable accessed relationship. Here, you're able to call the one true God your father and here's why. Jesus, John 3, 16, his only begotten son is a co-heir now with you and you are with him. So just to get this right, Think back to the language of the will, of the inheritance. Only one person has the rightful inheritance of the father. The parent only has one sibling, if you will. And that sibling's gonna get all of the father's inheritance. But before the father finalizes that, the son says, Father, I would like to share my inheritance with a bunch of other people that are not your children. And I would like you to adopt them. And I would like them to have equal relationship to you that I have with you. 
Now, if I put that in the terms of dollar amounts, I had that in the term of like some sibling, some rather child had, let's say, $14 billion, referencing their inheritance reference earlier, $14 billion. And they said, hey, I would like this person and this person and this person and that person. I'd like them to share in my $14 billion. They're like, man, I hope he picks me. I would not mind having my share of $14 billion. You'd be distracted and caught up by how much money that is, what you could do with that. But by comparison, with Jesus, the Son of God, the only rightful, majestic Son of God, has the entire world. It's all His. And all those who put their faith in him for the forgiveness of their sins, God says, I'm not only forgiving you for what you've done against my holy word, I'm actually going to now, as I've done for my son, share as his desired will, I'm gonna share everything with you as well. So that you are co-heirs with Christ. And God is your father. This is why it is so remarkable that Christians don't want to pray more than we do. Or Christians who, understandably, you probably are like me, sometimes you get caught up in, what would I say to God? What would I say to God? I mean, I'm just going to imagine if the person shared $14 billion with you, you might be like, I'd like to return and say thank you again. I know I said it 2,700 times yesterday. I'd like to refer to it again. I'm overwhelmed. Just the mere thankfulness a Christian would have to know that God has sent his son and his son has shared his inheritance and God has forgiven and has adopted all of those who put our faith in Christ and that we are now co-heirs with Christ, that we have access to him. Like, how long do we have? I would like to keep talking to you, God, out of just thankfulness. And just confess to you, I'm sorry, I keep acting like a beggar who's got no food, no resources, and I keep walking around this world like I have access to nothing, and my Father owns everything and has given it to me in Christ. Oh, how this could just curb our wandering hearts, curb our restless, thankless desires, curb our otherwise wandering affections to come back to the reality, to become a child of God is the highest and most humbling of honors given to us. It is because we have a new relationship with God and a new standing before him. Instead of running from God and trying to hide our sin like Adam and Eve did and cover themselves with failed attempts of fig leaves, to come before him and say, I'm covered in Christ. We run to him and said and say, God the Father, you are indeed my Father. I find forgiveness in you and I am adopted as a child of God. That is my source of hope, the security of my future, and the motivation to live my life worthy of the calling to which I have received. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Being a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords calling us to a higher standard, living a different way of life, and the future and inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. What a privilege. And to be inheriting all that and to find us so often like murmuring Israelites, grumbling, complaining. (laughs) How kind of God to be patient with us, to endure us, He made a covenant, and he's going to keep it. He made a promise, and he's not going to break it. It's not because of how good we are once we become Christians. It's because of how good his son is, who became a substitute for us. So the illustration is the law of God is temporary. The connection is that the gospel is how one is adopted and becomes an heir. And the implications are that Christians have God as their father. I can't promise you if you're going to be in your family's will. I don't know how your spouse is going to treat you when they pass away, if they do before you. But you know who does have a will that you are going to be in? God the Father. If you've put your faith in his son, 
He passes all that he has to his son, and his son shares that inheritance with all those who believe in him for the forgiveness of sins. And they have been given the Holy Spirit as a pledge of that inheritance. And that we rejoice.